Well, good morning. <laughs> a bit of an intimate one. Um, so yeah, I mean, the aim of this lecture is kind of just a bit of a summary at the end, more just about what we do, um, which kind of blends. It's you know, it's not clear cut with last week's lecture. It's sort of a bit of a blend, talking about the architecture of what we do, and this is more just about our jobs. So, I mean, the first bit is a very wordy section. I'll probably skim through that fairly quickly, and then we've got a typical school project, which is just about you know the sort of thought process we go through, and there's some case studies, some real world projects that we've we've worked on, and, and how we've sort of solved the problems on those, and that'll effectively be lead into the practical later on where we'll just uh, put forward a series of scenarios and uh, go through them. So, I mean, I put this slide up just to sort of highlight how broad acoustics is. I mean, acoustics, I think the literal definition of it is uh, the study of mechanical waves in a solid, liquid or a gas. So anything, basically. Um, so this is just a list I found of various acoustic professions. The ones highlighted bold, the ones I'm focusing on. I mean, acoustic consultancy is a bit of a red herring because that could apply to any of these. That's just telling people about acoustics but it's the building acoustics and environmental acoustics are the, are the two that are sort of that, that we cover as a company so we split it like that environmental acoustics is where is your building going ultimately that's always going to be out of your control um so that's going to be about how does your building affect the environment it's going into and equally how does the environment is going to affect the building so we look at it in both directions so the that, that's simply road noise is the main one but also any plans are coming on a building make sure that's not affecting things and then building acoustics has everything to do with what you're actually building. So putting particular rooms next to each other, what's happening in those rooms, layout of the building. There's not a hard line between the two. Obviously, they, if we've got a particularly noisy site, we might look to then put some of the rooms on the, that are less sensitive on the noisier parts of the building and things like that. So there is a, a blurred line between them, but we do tend to look at them largely in isolation. So what is an acoustic consultant? This was a question I was going to throw around the room, but <laughs> obviously it's just yourself. Me is the short answer. Um, so fundamentally, somebody that advises on what you need to do in a building uh, in terms of acoustics uh, and mainly compliance. So why are they needed? And this is an interesting one because needed is an interesting term. We're not really needed on anything. We don't, they don't have to have us. We're there to provide support. So, you know, you could go away, build a school, build, a, uh, build an apartment block without an acoustic consultant. If you're confident you know what you're doing, there's no need for us. We're there to provide the, uh, the consultancy to make sure that mistakes aren't happening. As I sort of touched on last week, acoustics is invisible to me. You only tend to notice once it's gone wrong. So we're there just to make sure that we uh, don't have to fix any problems at the end, which is always more costly than just designing them out from the start. So the top bullet point, helping ensuring uh, mandatory acoustic requirements are met. So those, these, are, these are the big ones. So if you remember last week, we had the four regulations uh, in approved document E. One to three was for residential and the fourth one was do what BB93 says in schools. So that's the top one, the main one, so compliance. And then the second one, ensuring a building is fit for purpose. So that obviously links to the first one, but this obviously extends to much uh, wider range of buildings, offices, healthcare, for example. So uh, well, I've got console on the list and then protecting noise sensitive receptors from noise pollution. So again, this is not to do with buildings, it's to do with what our building the impact the building's having on the, the surrounding environment. Bit of a question. Um, so there's certain like noise regulation for buildings of certain types. Yeah. So what happens when you, if you have like a church thing gets converted into flats or like a weird space that gets converted into offices? Do they have to like redo the sound of those spaces? Or just... Yeah, you effectively, it's, it's, it, from our point of view, it's a, it's, a, it's a completely new dwelling. I mean, in party for the residential blocks, you do have two sets of targets, one for a completely new purpose-built dwelling, mm -hmm. another one was what they refer to as a material change of use. So, for example, if it was an office block that's being turned into um, flats, there, there are separate targets that are slightly easier to meet. Um, okay. So there are different targets for each. And equally, if you um, yeah, change something to an offices, you would still have those same targets, but then the process you would take is you might go and test the existing building. What, what are we already getting out of these walls? Mm -hmm. Are they good enough already? So it, when you've got a when you're refurbishing a building, it's much more complicated because fundamentally it's a lot of it's done and you don't know what, what junction details have been specified, so you've got to go in and test it a lot of the time. And typically, I'd say if we had a £5 million school or a £5 million refurbished school, um, you typically be probably looking at one and a half to two times the amount of work on the refurbished one. It's just more difficult to deal with as opposed to a blank canvas and you can design everything perfectly from the word go. So always more complex, but equally a lot more interesting as well. So this slide, the main thing from this one I like is the, the three main levels, and this is a good uh, thought process to get into. 
Uh, so the first one is internal ambient noise level. So that's everything that's sort of uh, the, the noise level in, in, in a fully finished but unoccupied room. So if I go quiet for a sec, in this room we've obviously got, we can hear the projector, a few other things. Um, that's that's the that's to do with external noise breaking, mostly from your environment and also from your building services. So that's to do with things affecting your building. Then sound insulation, this is coming down a level. This is just looking at the building. So this is the adjacency rooms between rooms, making sure that if we've got a particularly noisy room next to a noise sensitive room, that the, that the partition between them is, is suitable, even better. If we can design it such that they're not right next to each other, even better. That's one of the best uh, um, sound insulation tools is layout and putting distance between things. And then the last one, reverberation times, that's coming down to an individual space uh, and making sure that noise builds up in the space. So for example, in this one, making sure it's appropriate for lecturing. And that's a very good sort of uh, thought process to go through in building design. So you start at the top level with your environment, looking at the noise break and break out of the building, then the layout of spaces, and then the individual spaces. So you sort of come down from a high level down to the lowest level of detail. And that's a, a lot of our reports are structured in that way, so it just makes the most sense. As I say, lots of wordy, wordy slides and skimming through them, but you know, principles behind the kitchen are the same. No matter what building you're in, ultimately sound isn't going to care what type of a building it's in. Uh, but yeah, the expertise here is, is knowing what, what design targets you need to apply to that. So obviously 35 dB is a background noise level target. Is that appropriate? That's the standard for a school. Is it good enough for a studio? Probably not. Is it good enough for an office? It's probably too good, you know, so we can, you know, simplify our design a little bit. And then also knowing what is and isn't possible with those constructions. So environmental acoustics. So I sort of didn't really touch on this, but just yeah, anything to do with the space you're putting your your building into. So this is looking at um, both ways. So I mean, this you know noise operations with the building. So for example, if we're designing a music venue, noise breakout from that music venue is going to be something we need to look at, and make sure it's not affecting a, a flat next door. We've got mechanical plants. It's the same thing again. Different different noise source for something we need to consider. Uh, wind farms, that's not something we touch on as a company, but they are noisy. Everybody wants renewable energy, but nobody wants it generated right next to them. So it's one of those challenges, you know, they do generate a lot of noise. And what, the, what they have sat doing is they do a lot of them out of the sea. I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah, there's quite a lot along the north coast of Wales, like, you know, the best place to do. They create sort of space for marine marine life as well. And if you talk about conveying, obviously, there is concerns of the shipping and making sure it's not in the way. And then the rest... Well, actually, road traffic and trains, that would be more about noise affecting the building. So a lot of these are going in different directions. And then construction sites, these obviously much more temporary noise sources. But we certainly have to consider there's a project we're looking at in Cardiff at the moment. They want to put a new school in Cardiff, and it's going right next to a, a studio. So the studio are very concerned that it's going to cause a loss of livelihood. So that's something we look at the sort of construction noise from that. Quantify if it is going to be a problem or not. Um, and yeah, and then just a few other examples. That's good because it was like, so on the London Underground, instead of lines, it's like incredibly noisy because you're like on the train. Are there any rules around that? Is what noise like, levels are you, as a passenger? Yeah, as a passenger. Uh, that's a good question. That There will be a noise level, but it'll probably be pretty high. Right. Uh, the biggest argument they'll have is that you're probably not on the tube for that long. Um, so noise exposure is all down to sort of how, how loud it is and also how long you're exposed to it. Um, I, there, are, there are regulations called noise at work, which is obviously a bit different, but I can't, it's not something we touch as a company, so I'm definitely not familiar with the numbers for it. But every time you um, add 5 dB to your sound, you have the time you can be exposed to that sound. Um, so I would imagine because, yeah, the average tube journey is probably 20 minutes tops, you know, um, I would imagine, yeah, they would probably get away some pretty high noise level so but yeah I, I don't know if, me if, there, if there is anything mandatory um <coughs> excuse me let's have a bit of water so a bit croaky on my throat this is an image i just like to sort of include um this is this is taken from the old 2003 bbi3 which is i think it's a good image it just highlights um a few considerations really most of the big one in terms of noise breaking, I think I'd go as far as say 90% of what we're looking at is road, road noise, rail to a lesser degree, unless it's in London, you know, sort of things going over the underground is definitely something vibration as well, although we don't, we don't cover that as a company. Aircraft noise is much less um, 
significant generally, um, although if you're under a flight path, you've got to be aware of it. Weather and rain noise, this is covered separately. There's just a set, there's a set standard for heavy rainfall, which has got a set drop size, velocity, and you have to use that data just to look at rain noise on, on lightweight roofs. Uh, and then obviously coming within the building, if you've got some children singing here, coming through, noisy corridors, just a few examples, and then the building surfaces. And it's just a tiny image just to sort of highlight some of the few things. And I guess it's the classroom bottom left is the main one that's getting impacted by the uh, uh, by the noise. Obviously got a teacher, a teacher people. And oh, BB93, the, the root sort of purpose of all of it is all about speech intelligibility. Can can the pupils understand what the, the teacher is saying? And every, everything works towards that, um, you know, so controlling, having an indoor ambient noise limit is limiting in it. And sorry, speech, let's take a step back. Speech intelligibility is all about your signal strength against your background noise. That's uh, so a signal to noise ratio, ultimately. Signal is fixed. That's just the sound power of, of the person talking. And then the background noise is a combination of everything else. So we have an internal ambient noise limit to limit how much noise is breaking in. We have sound insulation requirements that limit how much noise is coming through. And then we have reverberation limits to limit how much noise is building up in the classroom. It's all about just limiting noise breakout. But it is obviously very, very complicated. That's why we subdivide it into separate uh, categories and things. <laughs> it's just a list of a few of the people we work with. Um, I'd say contractors is probably the main one, so building contractors. Um, uh, two different ways, main ways that buildings are built. It's a traditional contract where somebody wants to build a building, they employ an architect to design it for them, uh, and a load of other consultants, they come up with their design, fix that design, and then they go out to tender where contractors will bid on who can build it the cheapest, basically, and the contractor will take that and build it. That's good because the client retains a lot of control over what they want in their building. Um, it's more expensive, though. The contractor's always going to um, have a higher price because they're not in control of how things are done. Ultimately, they have to do, if that's a particular wall finish or brick type they want, they just have to do that, and it might not be the cheapest. What's a lot more popular and common these days is what's called a design and build process. So somebody wants to build a building, they employ a contractor, so then and the contractor will employ the architect and the rest of the team and they will design and build it. Um, a lot cheaper to build a building that way um, because the contractor also has control over what, what how they do certain things. So they would say, well, I'm going to go for a steel frame because I know I can do that cheaper. I'm not going to have any fair face brick because that's expensive. Um, and they can know what trades they have available and build a building much cheaper. And the downside is the client just has loses that little bit of control over exactly what, what they want. So because of design and build is much more popular these days, although the more high-end projects it tends to still be traditional. It's, it's a mix, but we work with contractors a lot on those design and build contracts, which is why, um, yeah, that they're our biggest client. Also, it's just the type of contracts we tend to work with. Um, Good thing. I, I, I like working with contractors because it's real. Ultimately, you see a real building at the end as opposed to just a theoretical design. I'll cover the building stages later on. And then Bob a Builder, what we mean by that is just a, sort of a small company that's just typically just building a couple of flats, splitting a house in into two flats, that sort of thing. So they wouldn't get a design team involved. They just do it all themselves, do the building work, and then we just go and test it at the end. And then the Environmental Health Officer and the Building Control Officer, these are the noise police in a way. Um, so environmental health, they they will be the ones that you've got to convince that your uh, building is not going to have an adverse impact on on the environment in place. And so, and equally, that you're not providing a substandard building. For example, if you're putting a block of flats in a very noisy location, they might put a planning condition. So, what you once you submit the planning, these two ones will be looking at it, and they may set planning conditions that you have to meet before that building sign off and can be be used, basically. Um, and building control, they're just making sure that you're complying with uh, the building regulations, so there's formal requirements. So again, sometimes you have something that isn't quite compliant, or you're struggling for compliance, and it's always worth talking to these people, get them on your side. It's all about convincing them that you're doing a good job, and you know. But ultimately, they're the ones that sign things off, whether it is or isn't acceptable. And of course, the end users as well. We sometimes work directly with them. I think I have just covered or they'll just skim over these. The architects, they're obviously the lead designers. They pull it all together. They're the ones that draw the pretty pictures. You know, all the engineers bring it, make it, make it work. That's a little bit insulting to architects. It's not that straightforward. They're the ones that understand building layouts, 
and then they'll get advice from structural engineers that also help them make sure it isn't going to fall down. Services engineers make sure it's properly ventilated and power um, and uh, plumbing and all of that. Acoustic consultants make sure it sounds okay, um, but they typically take the role of the lead designer. Tractors, they're the ones that are actually building it, so they sort of liaise with the design team and then actually worry about the site as well. And then I think I've covered these, the so smaller building companies. Environment Health Officer Building Control, so yeah. These often get a bad rep. Um, they're very personal, so talking to one EHO could be very different to talking to another one. Some of them will be a lot more stringent on certain things than others. We've got a particular project in Lashy Centre where it's got some plant noise and it's way above the planning condition. So we're sort of, on one hand, we're arguing that the, the condition was a bit too strict and we'd never meet it. And on the second hand, we're sort of trying to give them assurance on what we're doing and how it's going to improve it. So, But the key is, is just to talk to them. They, they are just people at the end of the day and... You know, they get a bad rep because they're, they're ultimately they're the ones that say yes or no. But if it goes wrong and people complain, these are the ones that are going to have their head on the chopping block ultimately. So they've got to make sure that they're confident that it, it's all going to be okay. <coughs> so what, what we provide, so reports, design reports, that's, I guess, our legal document that sort of, you know, if we're going to get sued, that's what's going to get used against us or anything. Meetings and phone calls. Probably the two main ones that liaise with people help move a design forwards. I mean, talking to Pete, you can learn so much more about talking to somebody about design than fucking having a meeting as opposed to just looking through the drawings. Uh, yeah, emails. Organizations and videos. So these, I guess, support our reports. So an organization, we might give you in our software, we can predict how a space is going to sound. It's particularly useful on a project that doesn't have any mandatory targets to meet. Uh, such as a church, um, it's a good way. So what we can do is we can build a model of a space, um, put a sound source and some receivers in it, and we can sort of oralize um, how that's going to sound so, and play it, play it to them, and then we can put treatment in and, and show them the changes and kind of the audio equivalent, the pictures of how where you just be able to hear the space as opposed to understanding what the numbers mean. So that's something that can be really, really useful for us to produce at times. And equally videos as well, um, just to explain concepts. And obviously, you know, as you saw in the last lecture, I had a few in there, but yeah. Is that organization software is that separate and that build themselves or is it like No, no, it's an industry software. So we use Cat Acoustics, um, which is a rate tracing software. Uh, I think Kyle mentioned Odeon last week, which is sort of the one of the main competitors to it. Um, so yeah, you just build a three D model, um, and then it basically just simulates a sound source bite with a few thousands of rays. Um, and then it yeah. And it and then it builds an impulse response and then you can evolve that with and input audio um, to, to basically place it in the space. Uh, but I'll cover some more softwares. There are, there are some softwares we have developed, which I'll... Oh, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Didn't realize it was there. Um, the next slide. So Excel. So that is uh, the top one I'd say we use. Most of our calculation templates are, are built in Excel. Um, I think everybody puts in their CV that you can use Excel, but it's only when you come to Mac you realize, oh, no, you can't use Excel <laughs> until you... Uh, some of the functions we use just these advanced calculation sheets just to give to give a speed of what we do ultimately we, it's a lot of the same process so you just put in the, the input parameters and it just pops out the answers and then we can just tweak that on the fly even in meetings so that's a real real powerful tool word the backbone of making our reports teach the basic microsoft and then yeah cat Odeon, that's the room acoustic modeling software that we use i'd say we don't we don't use that much um we wouldn't use it on a we might use something electric theatre like this, where we want to look at specific, you know, we want to work out the speaker intelligence of that chair right in the back corner. Uh, but for standard classrooms, standard office spaces, we wouldn't really touch on that. Um, CADNA, so that, that's environmental noise prediction. So uh, in the case studies in a bit, I'll, I'll go on this, but fundamentally it allows us to map how noise is going to propagate outside. Um, so we use that for um, predicting, yeah, noise propagation across sites and on different parts of buildings. In so that, that allows us to build up a wall. So we, we touched on RWs and DWs last week. So RW is just a sound reduction through through a construction. So we can build up, you know, a couple of layers of plasterboard, a metal stud, some mineral, and it'll tell us what that's getting. Bastion, that that, um, that is looking at the a room to a room. So that's a bit more complicated. So that's look that's considering flanking junctions and the the stuff we showed last week with the wall and the floor and looking at percentages. That was that was done in Bastion. All of those calculations, 3D CAD viewers. So that I mean that's just something we use to look at architectural models. Everything is modelled these days. Um, 
although there is a case study where it was drawn by hand, which is quite nice, quite rare. But then these last two are stuff we developed, the sound testing software. Um, it's been a game changer for us that when when we go to test on site with our sound level meter, we used to have to sort of come back to the office, download the data, um, process it, and then find out if it's passed. What this allows us to do is now the engineer on site can upload it to a laptop, upload it, it's all online, the software, checked if it's passed or failed, but then the real strength of it is they can then call up someone in the office, discuss those results, and the person in the office can log on and have a look at it as well. So absolute game changer for us. And then FDTs, that's finite difference time domain modeling. This is something we developed to visualize how sound moves through different parts of a building, um, which again, there'll be a couple of videos on a bit later. Um, but before, before we go into those later, I just wanted to cover the REVA stages at Stanford Royal Institute of British Architects. And this is the standardized um, construction phase. So stage zero, somebody just wants a building. Uh, stage one, okay, what do you want that building to do? How much budget have you got? So that's understanding what, what we have to play with. Stage two, concept design. So this is just a sketch. What shape is it going to be? How many stories is it going to go? Whereabouts on the site is it going to go? Develop design. This is where we start to nail things down. Think, okay, how thick is every wall going to be? You know, where are the doors going to be going? We start to go. Technical design. This is getting much higher levels of detail. So this is, okay, where are the radiator pipes going to go? Where's the ductwork going to go? where are all the light switches going to go. So we've gradually worked out that at this point, we should have a finished design, and then we start building it. And then this is just a handover, so giving it to the client, making sure they understand how to use their building, particularly some of the more complex ventilation systems, and then just in use. So we're at typically two to five is when we're involved. Um, sometimes we just get involved in four, which is a bit difficult because a lot of decisions have been made on layouts and stuff, and we can't change as much. Um, but yeah. The earlier we're involved, the better, because we can just have a more subtle input into the building plan and it's almost noticed that like, we're not even there so a lot of the time if, if it goes well. And the only slightly confusing thing about this is obviously it's nice and linear like this, but what happens is you could be stage three and stage five starts as well, so they can run in parallel. So you can still be designing the building while they've started clearing the site, setting out the foundations and things. So, yeah, they tend to run in parallel sometimes just because time is money and ultimately it's different different teams ultimately the construction team and the design team are, are different sets of people so it makes sense to start doing the foundations if, if that's set out and then develop the rest of the design while that's taking place so that's uh, a very brief overview of that um yeah so now i'll just go through an example school and again just sort of applying some of those uh, thought processes and then some case studies just stuff that i've, I've worked on basically that I think is worth talking about, but <laughs> we'll see. <coughs> so I think this was a real project at uh, North Worcester Primary School a number of years ago. So image on the left is just our site, and then that sort of the color block is where the new proposed building is going to go. Um, so obviously kicking off a project, we need to know what we're going to do. So it's a school, so we know we have some mandatory regulations to meet BB93 from the building regs. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to touch on some of those uh, the requirements from that. So going back to that earlier slide, we start with the external noise levels, then we look at tenants, and then we look at the vibration control. So first thing is we need to understand our external noise levels. Uh, so this is our, our wider site. Um, so sort of hit obviously building buildings going here. From this map we just mapped out where are our nearest noise sensitive receivers. Uh, so I think these would be look like industrial units to me. These look like possibly office blocks. It could be an apartment, I'm not sure. They just like look like a lock looks there, so we've not considered those. Um, but yeah, so what we would do is we'd set up a noise survey. I've got, I've got some examples of case study later on, but more sort of road along here. Um, which looks like that will probably be our dominant noise source on the site. This looks like access roads, it's probably a lot quieter. So I wouldn't anticipate it being too noisy this site. Probably have got some um, survey data in a minute. So yeah, so as I say, that, that same process, looking at the internal noise limit, so controlling the external noise levels first, and sound insulation, reverberation. So internal noise levels, 
<sighs> okay, it's just where these slides, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we will go to the site with the cell level meter, we'll measure typically for 24 hours just to get a good daytime and nighttime reduction to noise levels. So when you say 24 hours, so like, they just constantly take an average Yes, we what we tend to do is we tend to measure for five minute periods uh, consecutively. So we'll set up a sound level meter in an environmental kit. I, I've got some photos later on, I think, so just to go through that. But yeah, and, I, and I'll show some graphs of sort of some of the data we get as well. I've definitely got some in the case studies at the end. Um, so yeah, so as well as so we'll look at the external noise level. Then also what we will do is we'll set a limit for building services. We don't typically get involved in the design of that. Um, it's quite complicated, um, quite specialist. So it depends what the it's something we can do, but we don't tend to do it uh, just because the it has knock-on effects on what unit you're supplying. And then if you put an attenuator in, it affects airflow and all sorts. And then you can get regenerated noise from the duct work. So we tend to leave it to the service engineer and attenuator supplier. They tend to be better placed to sort that out than we are. Um, so we sort of set the limit and they just have to work to that limit as a typical way that we work. Although other acousticians do might may get involved in it or specialise in it more than we do. Um, yeah, and then sound insulation. So we obviously touched on this um, last week. So the DNTW, that's the on-site target. That's what we have to do. So we calculate what the IW needs to be uh, in order to meet that. I'd say, you know, Certainly at the stage two side of things, it goes a little bit more bigger picture than this. We're not just looking at the calculations. We're also looking at, let's not put the special educational needs classroom that needs uh, really no, low noise levels right next to the drumming practice room and, you know, things like that. So, yes, we can calculate what that needs to get, but far better to design out by not putting them next to each other. So there's sort of a, a layer behind, behind this where we're just looking at the layout and if we're early enough then we can have an impact on that and again yeah one of the case studies later on we'll cover that so this is a, a ground floor plan if it makes sense in terms of a drawing have you ever seen a drawing like this before it's a plan plan drawing of the building ultimately so we've got a series of classrooms so this is a sort of a year one classroom well there's two year one classrooms open to each other which is a fairly common um, primary layout we do need to worry about noise transfer from here to here Open plan schools is something we do specialise in. Um, they died off in terms of popularity, but as soon as you take away the walls, obviously you're taking away your ability to really control noise transfer from here to here. So it, it does get very complicated. We look at sort of creating a choke point. We look at reducing the reverberation in these spaces. And ultimately, space management is huge. Um, but I'm not going to touch on that too much today. So obviously, we're going to sort of break out group rooms, some open areas in here, uh, dining hall. Let's see. Entrance lobby, reception desk. I think that's probably a head teacher's office. Don't really see it. The nursery. Um, and obviously the kitchen, top right, with the plant room. That's a fairly common layout. And then the first floor. So this just leaves the void. It's a bit more high space. Dining hall. And then it becomes a bit more standard. Just tons of classrooms in a row. With a few little breakout areas in the corridor. So it's a fairly, fairly common primary school layout. One or two forms of entry. Um, so yeah, it's not particularly maths heavy, is it? This this um, what you've learned so far, is it? No, they, they used to be, but they sort of Yeah. So yeah, well, I mean, I, I won't dwell on this, but fundamentally, it's an equation on how we we convert from our on-site target to what we need our petition to do. Do you find these to be quite in depth in maths in the acoustic world? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'd say it's it's pretty essential. I'd say. Um, I, everybody at Mac has probably at least got an A-level in maths or physics, I'd say, sometimes both. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you sort of do, you need to understand it because it needs to, I think you need to understand what, how things change. And it's more that react, understanding if something is the right answer or not, I think. You know, I mean, we, obviously we never type this out. We just have an equation. We, we just tell it what one room is, what the other one is, how long the wall is between it, and it pops out the number for us because we have those calculations set up in Excel to deal with this. So you can do a lot without knowing a lot about maths, but I think it's yeah it's something we almost always look for. But the main main thing for this equation, I mean, are you schematically or not really? No, but fair enough. I won't go into too much. But S is the surface area partition. T is the reverberation time, and V is the volume. 
So if SLT get bigger, the RW gets bigger. Uh, so if the surface area of the wall gets bigger, it's crazy to think obviously there's a sound power coming through that wall. If you double the size of the wall, you've got twice the amount of sound energy coming into a space. So to get the same DNTW, that gets bigger, that means that has to get bigger. Reverberation time gets bigger. Obviously, you, you, if you've got a longer reverberation time, sound is building up more in your space. So again, you need a, a bigger RW. But if the volume gets bigger, then your RW drops because if you're dissipating energy into a bigger room, it just disperses more. What's 10 long? That's 10 long. Have you done heard of logs? Mm. It's a lot longer, isn't it? It's, uh, it's fairly complicated. It's, um, it condense, what it does, it condenses huge, huge variations in numbers into a smaller scale. Uh, so the decibel scale is a logarithmic scale. So, I, for example, I think definitely going to get these numbers wrong. But if you just look at the sound pressures from things in watts per meter squared, which I think is the same as a Pascal, like a pin drop is, I think, 0.0000001 watt per meter squared. A jet taking off is one watt per meter squared, um, which is a huge. I think it's sort of like a basically a billion brain. You know, you know, I can't remember how many zeros. But then decibels is probably a hundred, not to 100, it, 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 you know, well, maybe sort of a pin drop might be 10, 15 dB, a jet taken off might be 120, 140 dB. So it's just a way of condensing huge ranges of numbers uh, into a very more manageable thing. And the, and the reason for that is because that's partly linked to how our ears work. Um, if, uh, I've got some really good videos and some other lecture material, unfortunately not here, but our ears are incredibly sensitive to certain things, um, but not to others. Um, like our perception and the change in, in sound, like if you had one unit of sound and you played two units of sound, you'd clearly perceive a difference in loudness. But if you have 100 units of sound and then played 101 units of sound, you wouldn't perceive that difference at all. So we can only perceive, you know, if, in a way, you know, if I drop one pin or two can we <coughs> Yeah, so it, that's why we condense a huge range of numbers into a logarithmic scale. So typically, um, I think one decibel is the minimum you can perceive in lab conditions. In real world conditions, it's near 3 dB. Anything less than 3 dB, you can't perceive as a difference. Um, but yeah, you'll have people probably trying to argue. And, and subjectively, a 10 dB difference is doubling. Um, so that's why. So obviously, 50 dec decibels is half as loud as 60. And then 60 is only half as loud as 70 as well, so it goes yeah. up. Like they always told us in this course that it was like 60 dB is a doubling, minus 60 or half. Yeah, in terms of, this is where I get to complicate, in terms of sound pressure, 60 dB is doubling. It do doubles the sound pressure. Your perceived loudness is 10 decibels. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, and the same as if you had sound power. Have you done sound power and pressure differences? Yeah, a, sound, a doubling of sound power is 3 dB, but a, the easiest way to think of that is uh, compared to a light bulb, think of a 100 watt light bulb. Well, I guess we're in the LED age, <laughs> a 5 watt light bulb. Uh, that will always have a, a set that, that will never change, but the brightness around the room will change depending on where the light is. Um, and so, so, same as my voice, it has a fixed power. It's always generating that, but the sound pressure is what you're hearing on your ears. So, if you were sat at the back, the sound pressure would be lower. Yeah. So. So power is a way to just compare things to each other, but pressure is what you experience and what's important at the end. Um, but yeah, despite saying I'm not going to dwell on it, I dwelled on it for quite a while. But uh, So this was just a, a work through example. I won't go through it now, but it's how the maths works ultimately. So we've got uh, two classrooms. So the, direct, the DNTWs are directional. So we'll, so that volume is the volume of your receiving room. So we'll, we'll calculate it into this space. Just so happens that they're identical, so it doesn't matter in, in this instance. But we've got 57.5 square meters, three meters tall, so we can multiply those to get the volume. And we've got a 7.1 meter uh, long wall, and again, we can multiply it by the three to get the area. Reverberation time of 0.6. So here we're putting the target, not what it actually is. Um, and then and that's basically the math of it. So we plug all those numbers into the equation. Get that 45 on site target, which BB93 tells us. Put it through and it gives us 41.7. But we uh, then had a 5 dB safety. Possible on site issues, I probably would have worded it better for flanking tolerance, ultimately, as we touched on. So, this this uh, um, calculation assumes you've dealt with your flanking. So, you can't calculate that, put that wall in, and it will definitely work. If you've got a huge issue with your flanking behind that, well, then it isn't going to work. 
ultimately. So, but this this equation assumes everything's dealt with. This is what the wall needs to needs to get. So we'll go around um, do that for all, all the spaces. So these are our on-site targets. This is what BB93 tells us we need to get between each of these two spaces. This is what we calculate using that equation. But then another step we do is we simplify it into bands of five. And this is simply just so you don't have uh, you know, 50 different wall types on a, on a project and architects are only going to want to build four or five. Sometimes it can even get simplified to just two, like we've got the small wall and the big wall, you know, depending on the development. Um, so that's why we tend to band them. We can band them differently depending on what, what particular wall types they've got, but this is sort of like our default nearest five. Um, and yeah, obviously they don't want to be worrying about coordination of different walls at different points. So then what we do is we produce drawing like this, um, where we mark up on the architect's drawing what the wall requirements need to be. Um, so yeah, so the yellow line here, so we've got 50 dB IW wall there, 45 dB walls, 35 dB doors. This is a problem, or not a problem, but a challenge. So having a door, doors are always weaker than walls. Um, so but this is something BB93 allows us, so we just put some text to say, look, we're allowed to do this, but sanitation there is not going to be as good. Like that. Yes, and then reverberation control, the last bit. So again, just another equation. Have you seen the, this equation, reverberation time? It's, I quite like it because it's well over 100 years old, this equation, we still use it. It's, um, it's just reliable, well, to me, it's uh, so RT60, so reverberation, have you, you covered that? Yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's defined as a, a decay of 60 decibels. Um, so and then this equation, so 0.161, that's just a constant, and that's basically the volume divided by the absorption in the room. Now, obviously, for BB93, we're doing things, we're going about, we know what we want our reverberation time, what we're trying to work out is the absorption, so we can rearrange it to this. So to work out the absorption, it's the 0.161 of the volume divided by the reverberation target. So for this space, um, so yeah, 0.161, the constant, which is the volume that we've calculated from the um, area and the height of the space, divided by this, so we need 46.3 meters squared of absorption. This is in savings. What we would normally do then convert that to a class A, B, or C if we don't absorption classes, course absorbers. Think so, yeah. yeah. Appreciate it's just you today. So it's all about what you can remember in this, in this yeah, moment. Yeah, I think we have done that. Yeah. But ultimately, uh, absorbers are rated. Class A is the best. Class E or unclassified is the worst. So this is 46.3 meters squared of just saving. So if you a class A absorber, that might go up to 50 meters squared, which you know you're going to be comfortable because it's less than the uh, floor area. So you just put a full class A ceiling in and you get the job done. If you were to go for class B, it might be 58. Class C, it might be 65. I'm just making them up. But you, you need a greater area because your absorber is not as, not as good, basically. You don't have to worry about having like, a certain amount of absorption on each, each surface. It's a good question. It's a good, I mean, in a school, you wouldn't because of the, you're just worrying about mopping up excess sound in the space. You've got furniture that scatter and diffuse the sound in the space. So it, it and your floor ceiling height is typically not that tall. I mean, we've gone three meters here. It's actually probably more commonly two point seven. Um, so it, yeah, in a school, you wouldn't worry about it. However, in different spaces, you would. In this space, uh, obviously, we've just got a ceiling. But then the big, the other big one is the absorptive seating. So that the, the real benefit of absorptive seating is it, it it should be as absorptive when it's unoccupied or occupied. And, you know, we want this lecture hall to sound decent when it's just one person in as it is today or if it's at capacity, you know, so we don't don't want the variation. But yeah, so that was it. Um, let's skim over some case studies now. Um, happy with that so far? All makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the, the, and the fundamentally, these are, these are real, real buildings that I've worked on, so... Um, a little bit more different, a bit more out there. Um, but yeah, so this first one, Will Stop Community School. It's quite old now, I think we finished this 2017, 2018. Um, it was a school on a very noisy site next to the M1. Um, it's for the Department for Education, so budget very, very limited. New building, and then when it's naturally ventilated, and it's noisy. So I sort of touched on last week, you open a window to let Air, fresh air in, it also lets the noise in. So it, ultimately, it was too noisy for simple openable windows. So we had a bit of a challenge on what to do with this, but we managed to make make it work in the end. So here is the site. So this is 
it was a, an existing old school and they were building a new three-story block to replace the existing school. We got the M1 motorway about 500 meters to the east. And it's fairly noisy on the side. Not crazy loud, but certainly too loud for, for natural ventilation. So we went to the site, set up a meter. This is uh, sort of the graph we got. Are these terms familiar at all? Not such those, okay. So L, basically it's a level, noise level. A for A-weighted. Then the EQ, the max, and the 90. So EQ is equivalent continuous. So obviously noise levels fluctuating all over the time. So that's basically just, the best way to think of it is just that's the average noise level at that point. So LA max, that's sort of like in the maximum peak uh, at any point within that. So we, this would have been split into five minute periods. And then the LA 90, that's the most complicated. It's the, to, to get your head around, it's the noise level exceeded 90% of the time during a measurement uh, period. Um, and that, but for, for your information, you just need to think about as a background noise level. That's that's what we consider the minimum there. Just when we go on. If you divide the percentages up, sort of one to, to hundred, uh, the LA one hundred percent. That's the noise level excited, exceeded one hundred percent of the time. So that would be your minimum, and then the one percent that would be just your maximum. So ninety percent is right near the bottom. What's the point in having the ninety not to have the minimum? Uh, it's just the industry accepted way of that's, uh, I mean, if you have a minimum, you could just have uh, an unrepresentative just dip in noise level, and then you're sort of designing that. So it's the one that's exceeded that. So it's where noise levels typically settle at the lower end of it, but getting rid of those very minimum ones. I mean, the very minimum ones, again, quite often come down to the sensitivity of your equipment, uh, you know, particularly just very brief. A, a minimum could happen for one second. Whereas if you're sort of considering noise level that's not exceeding the excellent time, you're actually it's sort of an averaging method. It's you know it's a different way of averaging to this one. But the reason we have the three different types, it's useful to look at the graph and understand the difference between them. Um, and as you get more experience, you sort of understand this. So obviously we know this is um, <coughs> excuse me, this is right next to a motorway. So the main thing we can take from this is our LA90 and our LAQ are almost the same, and they're absolutely flat and consistent. And that's because it's a motorway. Motorways don't change, you know. Uh, I mean, this, as you can see on the time at the bottom, this is only two hours long, this survey. There's no point measuring any longer than that. that that's, just, that's it. It's fairly, fairly consistent with 60 decibels. The LMAX peaks, so those are a bit strange. You wouldn't expect there to be peaks, but what this will be, this will be people nearer the microphone. So somebody could have just driven a car past the microphone or a person doing the survey could have dropped something. Um, so we, we're not really interested in those at, the, at this particular point, but I've got a bit of more detailed survey on the other case study, which I can go through. So yeah, the fact that the LA90 and the LAQ are so close together tells us we've got a very consistent noise source that's, source that's not varying at all, which in motorways is just a constant drone, so it's what, what you'd expect. Typically, if you were put it sort of next to some plant, like a fan that was running, you'd get a similar sort of graph as well. So this is Cadna, I mentioned earlier. So we, this allows us to generate this noise map. So what we've done is we've sort of built our 3D model, put in all the existing buildings, put our noise source over here, and you can see how noise is propagating and diffracting around these buildings. This is a smaller um, B round as well. And you can certainly see how noise is moving across the site. So this is very useful for us to predict uh, noise contributions. So what we do is we calibrate this based on our survey data. Um, so we'll have a, a measurement position at maybe one and a half meters mark on a map, put a receiver in our model, set our roads up, calibrate it, and then we can put, put the block in and assess the noise levels on that. And these are what we got. Um, the key thing for this is we were looking at the orientation of the building, and this is because we were involved early enough that we can have a say over what shape is the building going to go, where is it going to go along. For a school, generally anything less than 50, you can open the window and not worry about it. So obviously you can see this rear facade, we're fine. Front one, absolutely not. The side ones, mm, you know, sort of a bit not, not ideal. So the 60 one, that's almost the sealed facade. You can't open the windows to ventilate at all. Between 50 and 60, you can maybe do something. And so what about some like offices that I built to before, like next to main roads, and you have to open the windows to the top? So what would you do with that? Possibly, it could be for thermal reasons as well. So I mean, a lot of offices are mechanically ventilated, so. Uh, the ventilation system is obviously working to keep the building conditioned. If people start opening windows, then it they could get left open and it can result in increased energy use. It depends on the office, but certainly acoustics could be a, a big reason. 
I mean, it's one of those things. People don't like to be in sealed office blocks. You know, people like to be able to open the window. So there is a, you know, just a mental well-being. So even on this, you know, we wouldn't suggest not having an openable window. You know, we, if there are offices here, we say put an open window. If people want to open the window, they can. It's just going to be noisy. Um, but you, what the idea is, is that you don't design the ventilation system that it's dependent on you opening that window so so that you're, you can be protected from the noise if you want to. So we looked at these two orientations and ultimately it was, this one gave us the most quiet facades, but also the most noisy facades. Uh, and then sort of the ones that are sort of somewhere in the middle. So this was the orientation we went for on the end. Because we, and we figured these have to be mechanically ventilated, that's done. These can be naturally ventilated, that's done. And it's these ones on the side where we thought, well, maybe we can do something here. Um, so we ended up pursuing this one just to give us more facade um, that we could work with. And the key thing is, is we've got a very directional sound source. It's very clearly over, over to the west, the M1. And you can sort of see that by the noise map. In fact, we've got nothing on the east coming back. But again, because we were involved so early, I, I include this just because of how crude it looks. This is the architect's sketch. And what we did is we looked at moving spaces around. This is one of their early layouts that they might have. They had loads of classrooms around. Um, I skimmed over a slide I should have gone over. No. Oh, there we go. It's that one. <laughs> so, so we had classrooms along that side, and this was the initial layout. And we were at the point where we could say, look, let's move some rooms around. Let's see what we can do. So the ventilation strategy is key here. What did we need to open windows for? The offices were naturally ventilated, just with a simple openable window. Key thing for an office is it is slightly higher target, so we could probably get away with that. Music spaces are the most sensitive, but they're mechanically ventilated, so they're, they're not going to be openable windows anyway, just for noise disturbance from those music spaces. Classrooms, mixed mode. So that's natural and mechanical. So what that means is each classroom has this unit in here with an openable window. And the, the main thing for this is it saves you a lot of energy in the winter when it's freezing outside, as it is today. You draw in air through here, and your stale air comes out through there, but the air, the, the airs don't directly mix, but there's a heat transfer between them, so a lot of your stale air's heat is transferred into incoming air, and you're sort of recovering the heat. So you could have it, some of these can be up to 90, 95% efficient, so you could have air coming in at zero degrees. It gets warmed up to 17 degrees, comes into the room, gets warmed to 20, goes out to 20, and then it takes the heat out of it, and it goes out at two or three degrees, you know, so it, a lot of heat is retained. <laughs> But the ventilation strategy was key, just in terms of understanding what's going on. And this was sort of one of the earlier development sketches. So you can see, despite them being the most sensitive, we put the music classrooms on the noisiest facade. When I say noisy, 61 dB is not crazy noise. We can certainly rely on windows, facades to control the noise breaking. It's the ventilation openings is what, what we, what, what's making us consider it too noisy. So because these are mechanically ventilated, let's get them there. Let's use that space. Um, workshops had slightly higher targets, so we got those up along here. And then it was sort of these classrooms along this side that we were left with. Um, and you can sort of start to see some of the ideas we start playing with. We started looking at acoustic uh, screens to um, help protect the openable windows from noise levels. And that's effectively what we started to develop. Um, so this is the FDTD modeling. This is for a different project, but it's one of the better videos I can find. So what this does, allows us to visualize what's going on with sound, and it models the diffraction of sound, where sound bends around corners. So as it comes through here, you can certainly see as it comes through there, you can see it sort of bend around this corner. And this is just looking at, so this is a really powerful tool for us to visualize how sound is going into a building. And there's a couple of key points from it. Uh, it's about here, maybe. Yeah, so here, so you can see that we've obviously got the strong direct sound wave coming through. You can see the diffracted wave is much lower energy. So the more convoluted and difficult we can make it for sound to get into a building, the better. So this is just an example of an apartment with a balcony, and this is where we're using a balcony as an acoustic tool. Let's play the video. And also, what you'll see is you'll have that diffraction over the balcony, but by the time the sound is getting here, you'll see it's lost a lot of its energy. So 
we've got that just diffracted wave here, and then by the time it's diffracting in there, you can see that we're just getting much lower levels into the apartment than we were on the previous one. And that is sort of the goal of limiting noise breaking, is making the sound path as convoluted and difficult to follow as possible. So that was what some of our early modeling did do. So we looked at um, noise breaking prediction. So this is an inward opening window. So they, they, the ventilation design was already set that they would always have an inward opening 90 degree window. They were, absolutely were not going to change on that. So effectively what we did is looked at external screen that limit, limit the side opening window to a large degree. So the top one is our base case. So the target's 40, that's 35, and you get a 5 dB relaxation because you're naturally ventilating. We had a predicted indoor ambient. We were coming in at our prediction at 44, so it's too high. Um, so we looked at a one meter uh, uh, screen sticking out, still at 42. And then we looked at trying to much more enclose um, uh, the, the opening, so it's effectively making this much more probably a difficult pass for the sound to bend around. And then we also looked at this was just an absorptive baffle. So it's the same as that, but this was, had, was made of absorptive material, not reflective. So this is what we went for. This is one of the first times we've done this, so we wanted a bit of headroom, but we were, we were fairly confident we had a solution here that could work. And that was sort of the end of our involvement for a while. Um, and the project went into construction. And then sort of probably a good six, eight months later, we sent this drawing. So this is the amount of stuff to put this together. So this was the effectively the shroud that was going around the window. So you had the, I'll, I'll go on to some real images, but ultimately you have the opening window in this bit, and then sort of the ventilation unit in that bit. So you had this uh, shelf in here just to stop so it short circuiting and pulling wind, uh, air into the window when both are working in conjunction. Um, and on site, this was the first prototype that was turned up. Um, we made it out of aluminium. Um, so aluminium is lightweight, but because it's lightweight, it had, didn't have very good fracture toughness. It had to be six mil aluminium. It was very thick. It was 50 kilograms, this thing. So I got a call off the site manager. Not happy. But it had to, for insurance reasons, it had to be bolted onto the window frames. And he was basically, I'm not putting this on the building. It's going to get blown off in the wind. It's going to kill someone. And he was not happy about it. So I went to the site, um, had a look at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I that animation there, yeah. People's face looking at it, it's just yeah, not not, not happy. Um, had a look at it, and, I, and it was massively over engineered, um, it was too heavy. So, I put this again, link it back to the cell, really, but I put this together where we're looking at sort of frequency and octave bands starting at 63 hertz and the DBA. Uh, so, that was a noise on the facade, and all, all we were doing. So, we we'd work, yeah, our modeling worked out the diffracted sound component. So all we needed to do was the screen to have it at least 10 dB lower than that. So if you remember from last week, you know, if you have 40 plus 50 dB, it's still 50 dB because you ignore the lower one just because it's a logarithmic unit. So we were just looking to attenuate this enough that it didn't add to the diffracted sound, which we'd already estimated at the 36. So we looked at a series of uh, different materials, RFB, fiber, steel, aluminium, varying thicknesses. These are the sound reductions we calculated in InSol and, you know, looked at how much weight we could lose. And the end result was this, uh, which was 17 kilos, it's a lot, lot lighter. So this is a steel frame. No, uh, yeah, steel frame with very thin, I think, one mil steel sheets on it. Um, and yeah, and that, that was it really. So we had these around the windows. Uh, that's just what it looked like from the inside. So you can see the ventilation unit at the top of the window on the inside. Um, and yeah, so you can just leave the the good thing about this is the window's not being used for daylighting, so we had freedom to put stuff over it, because that's always a concern whenever you're blocking up a window, is are you, are you reducing daylight? And it worked. So this is our test results. So these were classrooms that were on those louder parts of the building. And a lot of this came in sort of... This one might be further down the building, so it might have been exposed to lower noise levels, but not, not far off what our prediction was, so we were fairly, fairly happy with that. And now we have this as a case study where we can actually say, yeah, look, here's where we've done it, here it works. Sort of see the results, all the sound is coming along here, and it, we're relying on diffracted sound. What well, is just the diffracted component? There is obviously a component coming through it, but it's low enough that it's not not influencing what's diffracted. So, so yeah, that, that's that. Makes sense. Happy with that. Yeah. 
So the last one, which is another little project I was in, involved in, uh, Stroud Chapel. I like this one just because it looks really pretty. Um, it's made out of cross laminated timber, which we covered last week, which is giant plywood. It's a beautiful, sort of tessellated roof, loads of angles going on, incredibly, incredibly difficult to model, but really, really nice, nice church, very reverberant inside it. Um, so yeah, so they, they really wanted something that's sustainable, so that they knocked down their old con uh, block, block, con concrete block for a church building, they wanted something real uh, showpiece. On a fairly noisy site, they wanted, they wanted naturally ventilated as well, <laughs> and ultimately they, you know, they, they really like the look of the CLC, they wanted it to be very clean looking inside, they didn't want a laying in ceiling, basically, yeah. things like that, or loads, loads of wall panels. So this was the site, again. Main thing here we got is a noise source We're right next to a road. Uh, it's just an A road, not a motorway. Uh, one of the main roads through Stroud, though. Um, so we set up a cell level meter there where the dot is. And here is what it is. So we have a, sort of, I mean, you can't see it on here, but this site is quite banked. It's a fair bit lower than the road. So we wanted to get noise levels at road level. So that's why it's on the tripod. And then the meter just ends up in this case. This is the graph we got. So this is a 24-hour period, so a much bigger sample period than the previous one we looked at. Also, you can see it's a bit, a bit more interesting, a bit more going on. So, as you'd expect, typical noisier in the day, then it quiets down overnight, and then it gets noisier in the day again. Uh, you can see that the noise is, we've got a much bigger gap between the two, the LAQ and the L90 this time, sort of the average in the, in the background. So, what this is telling us is that we haven't got a constant flow. Well, you know, certainly not like a motorway drone anyway. So what we have, we've just got individual cars going past, but there are enough gaps in those that noise levels are different between them and they're going up. And that's backed up by the fact that we've got these, these real big spikes as well. The real high ones are emergency services vehicles. Um, with certainly this one, you can see it's, it's impacting the average and the background as well. So wherever we have these big, really big spikes, that are also affecting this, that's something uncharacteristically loud. This is an interesting little peek here. So here are background and our average have joined together. So what that could have been is someone coming and parking their car next to the mic, leaving the engine running for five minutes, and we've just got a constant noise level for a little bit. So something that's atypical of the site, so we typically wouldn't focus on that. You can see that we're about 65 dB in the day. So again, another noise map we set up. So we've got the road going past um, the north of the site high noise levels on that facade. So we definitely, this sort of church is even more sensitive than a, than a school classroom. So whereas we'd be looking for 35 internally in a, in a school, uh, 30 in a, in a church is what we typically be going for. So there's no way we can ventilate from that north side. We even had concerns over the actual CLT as well. It's fairly lightweight compared to say a, a block work facade or something bigger. So we did have challenges just looking at that. We've got some windows there as well, which we, we had to look at. And they were going for sort of bespoke angled windows. It's quite, quite expensive and all that. But first of all, the ventilation. So what we did is we came up with a strategy where we'll let's bring it in from the south side. See how it benefits for just fresh air as well. We're not bringing it in right from a road as well. So better air quality. They had some beautiful gardens to the south, which bring the air in from. And then exhaust it out at high level. Um, so this is the this is what this is the section. This is a cut through one of the buildings. So we had main chapel space, so the road to this side, uh, and then we had a sort of plant room here. Um, so what we did is we managed to put some ducts in here, bring the air in, and uh, yeah, eventually out through the space. Uh, I do teach this um, to students that understand about ventilation stuff a little bit, so that's why I've got this graph. But so you don't need to worry about that. But what it's basically showing is at a low level. Air naturally wants to be drawn into a building in a high level, it naturally wants to draw out of the building. So outside you get a much bigger drop off in air pressure with um, with height in the building, it's a bit more constant. Uh, so yeah, air naturally wants to get sucked out of the building. So you probably notice this in, in your home if you open a door downstairs and a window upstairs, the door normally slams shut because ultimately air is through a rush through the building um, to exhaust out at the top. Uh, and this is sort of just some of the development of the design. I quite like this. These are, these are actually hand drawn by the architect. He's probably in his 60s, 70s. The architect, really old school. 
really good architect, great. love just seeing it literally the building come out of his head fire his hand you know just drawing it there in the meeting is quite 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 cool so these are some of the early ideas and they're bench seating along the side so we ventilate it through here and that's sort of branching onto ventilation beyond acoustics now um and yeah exhausting it out was through this high level opening at the back so this is this is on site now you can see obviously the uh CLT structures and shape, the windows aren't in yet, but you can sort of see the, the detail and the angle of the roof. A lot of effort into the structure of that from the structural engineer as well, so it looks quite cool. Uh, and this is just uh, another little thing. So back from so the chapel was over here. So down here we had this little office. We had this wall along here. Um, and this was just, uh, so they had this little window here. And where's the next one? Let's like that. Um, so we just looked at, so well, you're putting a wall there, so what we did is said, well, if you just increase the height of that wall, it'll create a barrier for you, reduce noise levels here, and, uh, you know, you can actually ventilate that. So it's just a, an example of a little opportunity that, that, that exists if you look for them and find them. And again, it just goes back to the client being really keen. They wanted to naturally ventilate this building fully, so we were just looking for options that, that, that allowed us to do that ultimately, and it's just a sort of a little um, example of that. So onto the room acoustics of the space itself. So this is our, our 3D model of it. Um, and so the table bottom left is just looking at some modeling results. Um, so what we did, so the, the main thing for this space, again, as I touched on with this lecture theater, you want to minimize differences in changing capacity, relying on absorptive upholstered seating is absolutely key and that is providing the majority of your absorption within the space so that's what we model the blocks as so that is our sort of our baseline model absorptive seating what we did is we looked at sort of variation in occupancy so you've got we've got data for all these seats when they're unoccupied and when they're occupied as well um and what we did is we looked at so so one two three four these are the receivers so we set up four receivers around the space just to average it we set a sound source on the stage and you can see we've got a fairly consistent, we're about 1.6 when it's unoccupied and about 1.4 when it is occupied. That's a little bit lively for this. There's nothing mandatory for this, but they really, they wanted quite a, a lively space. They didn't want it to be too dead. Um, for part of the congregation, the, the person doing the, um, the talking faces away from the uh, congregation and faces towards the altar. And a lot of their voices is reflected sound. It's quite, it's quite interesting. I mean, you, it's difficult to localize where the sound is coming from. It's quite, quite cool. So, they, so they, they were really relying a lot on the reflected sound. Um, so they, yeah, we decided this was a little bit too long. So what we did is we looked at adding a little bit of absorption, which we put on the back wall here, and that sort of brought us down to sort of the 1.2, 1.4 second mark, which is still quite lively. But they were quite keen. That's what they wanted. Um, a little bit longer than normal, I'd say. Normally for a church, well, it depends. <laughs> I mean, what, what is a church? It could be a cathedral where you're at three, four, five seconds, or it's more like a community centre where you're at sort of 0.8 to 1 second. So, you know, it can vary hugely. And again, in the absence of uh, any guidance on this, we just had to be as transparent as we could on what they were getting. So we did use oralizations on this clips and to give them an idea of what they were going to be getting. Um, and this is where, where I think it got, got quite nice, the project. So this is looking at sort of going back to that sort of ventilation stuff, and that's part of the reason why I was talking about it and the acoustic absorption. What we had is at high level, we had these timber slats. So it effectively allowed air to pass through it. Um, and what this did is it allowed us to integrate the acoustic treatment at the back of the space. So we've got this sort of mineral wall, so that loft insulation that is providing us with our absorption. But we also have our ventilation path out through the, through the building as well. I think there was an attenuator. I think this is what that was supposed to be, an attenuator, just because we did have high noise levels there. But the, the great thing about this is it's effectively a completely invisible ventilation path out. Acoustic treatment's hidden. And the end result was that. Not the best photo. Well, so you've got these timber slats all the way up, mineral wall. And you've just got a, basically a big sort of rectangular opening here where you haven't got anything, and that's where the air is being drawn out of the space. I think you may also have been able to draw around the outside of it as well. Uh, but I think just a really nice example of a very well integrated design where you've got your acoustics, uh, your ventilation. So I think the inlet fence was up down here and sort of this bench, bench seating. And that, that, was the, that was the end result. I mean, that was, that was the project in the end. The seating was a little lighter on its upholstery than planned. So I think it's probably a bit more reverberant than what we what we modeled but yeah 
one of those things that just changed a bit. Uh, yeah, just the last point. I mean, it did get an article uh, done on this. The guy that guy that was doing it um, recognition, and but it's just something I like to touch on in, in, in acoustics is that at the bottom of the article I have the credits for it. Yeah, so I've got the expert engineer, service engineer, quantity surveyor. They've even left a little gap there, <laughs> but so you know. But ultimately, we didn't make the list, unfortunately. So I just I wiped that on. But I mean, it, it, the main thing is, is also, this is a great example of a project where we were just very involved with the architect, even the structural engineer, so everybody, probably the quantity surveyor. I can't quite remember, but we were so well integrated that almost there weren't any acoustic problems. It just we just made sure that the design worked. It was a very so involved that they forgot we were there, you know. But that, that's one of the things about acoustics, as I touched on last week, is that, you know, people do tend to not think about it until it's gone wrong. Um, and that's one of the sad things about acoustics, I guess, um, unless you're designing something that's very obviously is an acoustic space, like a concert hall or a studio, then, yeah, it, it can get forgotten about. But, yeah, such is life. But, yeah, and that, that's it. So, yeah, finished. Almost bang on, despite starting late.